Okay, so Go High on Cash podcast, Guy Seiko. Guy, good to have you on tonight. Uh, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing? Yeah, hanging in there, ready for some uh, defense soap duels coming this weekend. Is this the fifth year for the defense soap duels, guy? Actually, believe it or not, the defense soap duels started when well, it was the Cleveland duels, when Gus and Logan and Felipe Martinez and, you know, the, the Ohio dogs and all that were us. It's, it's about 20 years old. Okay. We took a little break and then we came back. And this is probably around, yeah, maybe five, six, seven years again since we started it up again. Yeah, my nephew Ian used to take some lumps in the Cleveland duels. He, Ferg, yes, he said, my brother, he said he used to take some lumps there. Same tournament. Yeah. He wrestled in that. And I remember, I think he wrestled Gus in that. Lost to Gus, never beat Gus. And he said, I remember Ferd said it used to be in, he called me, it, where were all the locations? That, did you ever have it in Beachwood? The the duels, no, it was always at Cleveland State. It was always at Cleveland State. Yeah, he took some whippings there. He took a yeah. couple beatings there. Ian took some beatings. And then West Shore, obviously, was one of the groups that he took beatings from. Uh, but you, how many years break do you think you guys took? Uh, probably, probably a good, uh, eight years in the middle there, probably. Okay. And that was right at the time when you were starting defense and still working as a police officer. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah. Uh, defense started in 05. 05 and then I right. retired from the, the force in 2015. Okay. So that would be right in that 10 year period would have been like during the break of it. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a necessary break that you guys needed to take. Uh, so, 05, when Gr but Gus graduated in 2010 or 2009? Mm, I'm not sure yet. That's my wife. Yeah. She's up these things. <laughs> okay. So, Around I think there. it's he's 2000, he's 2010 grad then, I believe. Because yeah. he was a two-time state champ for the Eagles, right? For St. Edward? Yeah, two-time champion, three-time finalist. Lost in overtime his junior year. Who did he lose to? Jerome Robinson. Jerome, a St. Ignatius guy to boot, yeah. huh? Yep. And now Gus runs the warehouse at Defense Soap. He wears a lot of hats here. He's a warehouse manager. He's a logistics manager. He's in charge of EPA registration. And there's, there's a lot of things that he does here. Gotcha. How far is the uh, factory and office and world headquarters of Defense Soap where you are right now? How far is it from where you live? Mm, about half a mile. You're that close. Yeah. Right there. Okay. You trip and fall out your door and you land at Defense Soap. Yeah, I, I feel guilty starting my car and driving it, to be honest with you. <laughs> That's super close. Uh, so you guys have a workout facility on site there. How often do you think you use the workout facility at Defense Soap? Well, it's used every day, uh, but for um, every morning, Russo, Chris Russo and I work out. You know, we plan our day, plan or what short day with Charlie every every morning here. And then it's used for wrestling on snow days or days that we can't get into as like to have a player or to have a big basketball game or something where, you know, it's better for our little guys not to run around. We'll just practice here. So the wrestling room itself, as far as the mats with kids practicing on it is, is kind of almost auxiliary when you need it. And then every day you guys work out in that, like all, all weather area. That's like almost like the lobby area by the locker room. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we use the mats too, but we use them for calisthenics, not any wrestling. Okay. So Chris Russo, he uh, is actually from Amherst, Ohio, right? Yep. Lakeland Conference. We're Lakeland Conference guys. That's I Ohio. was Wellington. He was Amherst. What's your guys? Are you a little bit older than him? I'm four years older than him. Yeah. Four years. Okay. Because he was a, a couple times state finalist for Amherst, I remember. He he replaced me at Cleveland State. Is, are you when serious? Left, yeah, when I left coaching, he came in. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a, wow, what a small world. So Chris was so he went to Indiana and wrestled with Joe McFarland, didn't he? Yeah, McFarland. And then and then um Gold Goldman. So he'd have been like the beginning of Goldman end of uh Joe McFarland, right? Exactly. Okay. And Chris was, I want to say, a two-time state finalist for Amherst and a one-time All-American for Indiana. 
And it was an all American. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly. Okay. But I was there for uh, when you guys had, ah, uh, uh, geez, who did you have? Champion in life. You guys had Richard Jensen out there. And you and Chris were kind of simultaneously running a practice with West Shore with Richard there, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Chris, Chris knows wrestling. <laughs> Chris yeah, he, definitely knows wrestling. He, you know, he's like one of 12 Division One guys that I have as assistant coaches in my room. Right now, you know, uh, the youngest and the most active is Schroeder from Cleveland State. He coaches with us, too. So I got a nice, nice group. So how often do you say Devin Schroeder comes over and works with your kids? Twice a week. Wow. That guy's got a lot of energy. So he's going to all the college practices, which is multiple a day as far as individual workouts and weightlifting. And you guys are able to get him over to West Shore a couple of days a week too, huh? Yeah, he, he lives in Lakewood right next to St. Ed. So it was an easy thing. The kid loves wrestling and he's perfect. You know, he's like 138 pounds. He could roll with anybody in the room. I and mean, that's good to have young kids, like you're saying, young, active guys like that. Who else do you guys have come in? You said you got 12 D1 guys. Who else comes in to West Shore? Uh, of course, you got Leonard, you got Charlie, you got me, you got Gus. You have um, – oh, geez, let me go through this. You have Nemec. You have Polk. Um, I'm forget, I'll forget somebody. Sean, Sean Nemec comes to your guys' practice? Yeah, he's got a little kid in the program. He's got a three-year-old. He rolls around the beginning program. Okay. Uh, where does Sean Nemec live? Where does he live? Yeah, where does he live? Uh, probably Rocky River, somewhere around that that way. So it's good when they're all right there, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, I'm always looking for a replacement. I'm looking at Sean. He's got a three-year-old, so that it'll be good to ensure. He would ensure things for another decade. Um, but the problem is I think he's too smart. <laughs> what about Gus? Uh, Gus is going to be the next head coach of St. Ed's. Yeah, I kind of see that coming. That's what I see coming. Gus, Gus is all business, man. I'll tell you what, your guys, say your that. guys. That's what's, what that? what's that? I said I probably shouldn't say that, but that's what I'm guessing. You know? I mean, that's what it feels like every time I see it. It looks like, I mean, Gus is the obvious next guy to me. I mean, it, it, it's such a tight circle at St. Edward's. I mean, it's got to be a St. Ed's guy. You know that. I mean, yeah. Gus and then makes when, sense. When Max moves up to high school, I'm going to call it quits. It'll be 30-some years at West Shore. I'll call it quits. And then Charlie's going to move up to the high school, too, I think. So we're going to have to find a new – Charlie will follow Max. And I'll sit on my couch. Do you think it's a situation where if you guys are able to bring in the right person, that you guys will bring in somebody that um, will be able to be involved in St. Edward – and West Shore, and it's like a type of thing where the person could actually almost make a living doing it? No, I don't think there's money to be made in it. I think once you go down that road of trying to make money in wrestling, it kind of spoils the whole thing. Um, you know, I pay for most of that program myself out of my pocket, including my, you know, I pay I have coaches on salary and 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 that. Um, I pay for that. Our, our club fees are $200 a year. That's not paying for 12 guys, you know, and I pay every entry fee. I pay all that. Um, and I do that a couple of reasons. One is some, our schedule is expensive. I mean, it's hard to do our schedule. So I, I, I try to ease it up for the parents a little. Um, but then if I pay for it and I'm not making money off it, I could say and do what I want. You know, I don't have to, you know, I'm not anybody's beck and call. I could coach purely and freely. And, you know, that's always been my intention. Once you start putting money in or people start paying you, then you got to try to pacify people. I'm not in the position to pacify people. So when West Shore started, what, what's the history of West, or, West Shore from who you took it over from and where it started? Well, it started with um, Howard Ferguson, obviously. And then when that first group of kids that he had got really good, he needed to find a place from the wrestle. And, and that's how he kind of got to St. Ed's, to keep the kids together. Um, and then they went to St. Ed's and then uh, Marty Spann, you know, remember Marty, he took over and he ran it for uh, quite a few years. And then Mr. Burnett actually took it over and he didn't like the why he didn't like the, the politics of the why. 
and he be, he made the um uh, he he left. He started the All American Wrestling Club. So and, Ron Burnett was running West Shore out of the West Shore YMCA. Is that is that correct? Well, he technically, but they, they never gave us a room. They never gave him a room. He still had to find his own place to practice. And I'm not sure where where he actually practiced. But the Y never gave a room. So he left. He didn't. He didn't like um like I said the politics and the way that the the Y treated us. And they and then the, what and I didn't work with him at the time. I was coaching. I coached at Cleveland State. And then, then Gus was born, and I went to CYO, and I coached CYO a couple of years. But Gus was like four years old, and I said he can't compete to the fourth grade. I'm like fourth grade. That's an eternity away, you know, from four years old. So I called up the Y. I said, Hey, you got any wrestling going on there? And they said, Well, we're starting the program back up again, and there's two coaches, Rich and John Ramsey. Well, you know, they were my college teammates. I know Rich and John Ramsey. So show up, and they're like, Hey, guy, what are you doing here? I'm like, Hey, I'm bringing. Gusta, um, Russell, like I'm not going to let him wrestle and CYO for six more years. You know, I, I need a place. I want to start wrestling now. So the three of us started running it and that lasted for a couple of years. And, um, Rich and John kind of moved on and I kind of just inherited the whole ball wax myself. So at that point you take it over. How old is Gus when you get full reign of the program for West shore? Yeah, probably 10 years old. So Gus is 10 and Gus is in the process of, you know, he won the tournament of champions. I know that cause he beat my nephew Ian in the finals. Uh, he's won, he won everything as a youth and then bridging the gap from him to St. Edward. Where are you at when Gus hits St. Edward? What, what's in your head? Like now I'm not, I don't have a kid anymore. Right. Max isn't born yet. You got a kid at St. Edward. And you're still running youth things? How did that work for you? Yeah, I'm not sure how or why I actually stayed there. I ask myself that all the time. Um, I mean, I had nothing to I had nothing in that program for 20 years. You know, I, I just coached for some reason. I just felt like I needed to stay there and I coached there. But real fast, you know, Gus Russell Ian from when they were tiny tykes all the way to the NCAA championships. Yeah, he beat him at the NCAAs in the consolation in like 2012, I want to say. 2012. He was second seed that year, wasn't he, Ian? Ian was like the fourth or fifth seed. And Gus, <laughs> Gus, he folded Gus up like a lawn chair in the first period and then tried to shut her down. And Gus chopped wood on him and beat him. 98 or something like that. To me, that's amazing that these kids. And then you know who eliminated Max was Cam Desari. Cam oh, Desari. The next, yeah, the next round, he, he ran into Cam, didn't he? Yeah, and, and – uh, I think Gus's record against Ken is 18 and one their entire career from little kids. We're talking five years old on all those kids. Yeah. And they end up eliminating each other out of the NCAA championships. It was kind of bizarre. Yeah. He was probably 19 and over as Ian. Uh, yeah. They wrestled a lot, but those, <laughs> it was something those, like he never beat him though. Ian never beat Gus. You know, who else never beat him was Cody Garbrandt. Never beat Gus. No, it, Gus never lost to Blair. Gus never lost to Paris Graham. That's he crazy. Had, he had an interesting career, but he lost to St. Ignatius. He lost to St. Ignatius guy once that we know of. Yeah. Did he wrestle him in the districts? Did he wrestle Jerome Robinson in the districts that year? Actually, was district and state. He beat him three times. And then lost to him in the state final. And overtime, yeah. I mean, you know what they say, uh, guy, you can't win them all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sometimes you lose tough ones like that. Uh, so you have no skin in the game. For a really long time at West Shore. And then Gus is done. Gus goes to UVA. When is Max born? What year was Max born compared to when Gus was still wrestling? Yeah, Max was born in 2013. So that was like Gus's second or third year at UVA. So Gus is in his second or third year of college and Max is born. How right. crazy is it to res hit reset? Because you have, you know, you have another family. Okay, right? Gus's mom is no longer in the picture. You get remarried and you have a new family. What is that like for you? How old were you when when uh, Max was born? Oh, uh, Max is nine and I'm 55, so 40, 46. <laughs> what is that like to hit reset at 46, man? It's, it's, well, what's interesting is my wife is eight years older than Gus. That's kind of awkward sometimes. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, but that was a situation where she was the she was like your saint though. 
Your yeah. wife was a huge part of saving you guys and helping you guys out when, when Gus was in high school, right? Yeah, she was 24 years old, raising a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old kid. And was, I give her a lot of credit. It was, was not easy, you know? Ashley, your wife Ashley's an angel, man. Yeah, she's good. She's a trooper. I mean, seriously, she was, we were living in a two bedroom apartment in, in Lakewood. Uh, you know, here's a 24 year old girl working two jobs supporting my kids. It was bizarre, you know. And your daughter, how old is, your, is uh, Gus's younger sister? Because there's two sets, two sets, a boy, girl, boy, girl is what you have, but you've got two yeah. different sets, boy, girl, boy, girl. What is, what's, first off, what's Gus's sister's name? Elise. Elise and Elise is, I I want to say I want to say she's Coast Guard, but it's not Coast Guard. Is it is it Naval Academy? Oh, she she's went to the Coast Guard. Coast Guard Academy. She, she went to the Coast Guard Academy. She's designing some electrical system on the newest aircraft carrier right now. It's bizarre the things that she does. Super successful. Just never asks for anything. Puts her nose down and just works. So Elise is twenty nine. Yeah. So Elise is twenty nine. Coast Guard Academy grad. Goss is UVA grad, and then there's some bumps in life, right? There's some there's yeah, some, there's some things that take us places we don't normally go. And Ashley comes into your life, helps you raise Elise and Gus through high school, right? Yep. Then what? Then what comes to your mind? I'm dating this younger this woman who's how much younger is she than you? Seventeen years. She's seventeen years younger than you. She helping you raise your kids. She seems to dig you, obviously. And you're like, I think we should start a family together. What goes through your mind? Are you scared to death at 46 years old? Well, I told her we could either have happy hour the rest of our lives or we could have kids. It's up to her, but I was going for happy hour. She said she <laughs> wanted kids, so keeps keeps me young. Uh, listen, it takes a special mom to be uh, a wrestling mom like she is because I see her at all the events. She goes to everything. Your wife is reserved, though. She's chill. She's laid back. She doesn't lose her mind. It depends. I don't uh, ever see the lose her mind part. Uh, I remember uh, is he the first or second time Gus was at the NCAA championships. It might have been before he wrestled Ian. Who knows? But, I mean, you know, people always said, yeah, you're so lucky to have a kid to wrestle in the NCAA champ. You know, you got to be careful what you wish for. I had my head on the rail. I couldn't pick my head up. I look over my wife. She's balling. It's not even her kid, and she's balling. It, you know, that's. That that's that's stressful on parents. Let me tell you, NCAA championships is nothing to joke around with. So you signed up. Let's hey, let's let's sign up for round two here. Sign up for round two. How old are uh, uh, Max and Emma? Uh, Emma at Max and Emma. Max is nine. Emma is seven. Seven. Oh man, you are. <laughs> you did sign up. You did. Yeah. So Emma, I know Emma likes to dance. Emma's super active. I see Emma's doing a ton of stuff. You guys live in Vermilion. It's totally a different scenario how you're raising uh, Elise and Gus to Max and Emma. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Gus, it drives Gus crazy. Gus, Gus, I was telling a story the other day. When Gus was four years old driving to West Shore, West Shore, he he was um, he would sit on the front seat of my pickup truck, the bench seat you know, of my GMC pickup truck singing ABC. He's trying to learn the alphabet because he had to test to get into Catholic school back then. They didn't just take everybody. He had to qualify, you know, and I was afraid he wouldn't get in. So we would sing the alphabet on our way to practice on a bench seat. Now Max rides in the back seat of a Mercedes to practice. That's a little different. You know, Gus grew up on a 27 foot boat. This kid's got a, you know, 35 foot carver. So it's a little different. Yeah. It's, it's wild to think that, you know, you said that to me, the, the term you said to me is Gus was raised on a wooden spoon Max is being raised on a silver spoon, I believe was the term. And I was that you remember saying that to me? Yeah, Gus was definitely a wooden spoon, blue collar. You know, I'm still really a blue collar to my roots. I have, you know, I, I have a really good life, you know, and, and I never, I'll never say I don't I have a really good life. But, you know, I'm a blue collar guy that grounded out, you know, and that's why I have a really good life. Um, and I, I try to keep that in perspective when I'm raising my kids. Uh, it's as you get older, you know, you get a little softer. Um, you want to spoil them a little bit more and, and today, you know, nowadays, but Max is a really good kid. He would rather fish and hunt and throw axes in the woods than uh, play a video game. You know, he's just that kind of a kid. So um, I got lucky there. 
I know you probably watched the interview with Max, but Max, the interview I'm been with Max Seiko, he's highly intelligent and well spoken. I think a yeah, lot of people were like shocked by that, though. I think all my kids are smarter than me, so that makes that's one thing they they got going for them. But he, yeah, he's a he's a clever little guy, pretty good kid too, really good kid. I was I love talking to him, you know. And, and Max doesn't say much. He works hard. He does everything you ask of him. He's tougher than heck, man. Max is really tough. What I'll say about Max Seiko, the way you set him up a lot of the time is he takes a lot of lumps and you have him wrestle up a lot. And what I mean by up is he wrestles up in age groups. Example, national middle school duels. Max can be wrestling seventh and eighth graders who only weigh 65 pounds, right? He wrestles up. He wrestles up in the age groups and it's designed like that, right, guy? Well, yeah, sometimes I feel bad about it. But this year, that kid's beaten four. He, he's avenged four losses from last year this year. And one of them was returning Tulsa national champion. So it's not like uh, these are like, you know, the corner weekend, you know, matches that he's he's winning. I mean, he he lost first round Tulsa Nationals, came all the way back, wrestled nine matches, consolation to place third. That kid that beat him first round, he pulled in Tulsa Nationals this year and he eliminated him to place. So, I mean, when you're beating and returning Tulsa champion, you, you know, you're making some strides. Do you ever feel like you're doing too much or you're going too hard? No, never. We we take the summer off, you know that. I mean, I, we go seven days a week now, but you know we're we're old school mentality here. We, we'll, we'll wrestle one day a week during summer. You know, there's a lot of other things to life that we do, but um, now we don't go too hard. As a matter of fact, we're we're starting to crank things up right now. We're not going hard enough with these kids. You uh, recently uh, in an interview said that uh, fourteen of the fourteen starters at St. Edward are West Shore, and that's the first time it's been that way. How proud of, proud of that are you? Well, I, I, I was talking to Andrew Gasper about that. And what I didn't mention to him was in that match against um, Perry, we have 14 guys. Three of them will be replaced in a lineup when the football players come. But the three that are replaced are other West Shore guys. Goldberg's out. They put another West Shore guy in there. So, I mean, right now that, that 14 is actually 18 kids that are rotating in and out of that lineup that are all West Shore kids. But the really interesting about that duel is, is Perry won one match. Perry won one match, and then they had the forfeited heavyweight. The kid that won Perry's match was a West Shore kid. Was it was it a roar? Yeah. So West Shore won all the matches on both teams other than the forfeit. So is Kilbane's a West Shore guy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Kilbane – is uh, he's he's literally like an NFL caliber football player. Um, he's the heart and soul of St. Edward, who won another state title in uh, football this year. I don't know how they didn't go. I don't know how they lost. They lost to Maslin, um, but smashed Springfield in the finals. Actually, were down early and ended up scoring like twenty eight score points uh, uh, unanswered. Ended up winning twenty eight fourteen. But that guy's the heart and soul of it. He doesn't need to come out for wrestling this year. He could graduate from St. Edwards early and go to Penn State, Ohio State. Where I don't know, where's he even committed for football? Uh, Northwestern. So Northwestern. He could leave this month and go to Northwestern. What's yep. it say about St. Edward wrestling when uh, Michael Kilbane comes back for his senior year? Oh, that's what you say about him. He wants to. Uh, he wants to do better than he did last year in the state tournament. He wants to try to win it. He's going to have a challenge because there's some, that Perry kid's really tough. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the kid wants to win the state tournament. He's driven in, so hopefully he gets it done. I think it's a, a, a testament to, obviously, what you guys did at West Shore and Coach Heffernan and, you know, Gus and the other assistant coaches at St. Edward, man. They do a really good job. They had a top 10 finish this past weekend at the Ironman, three placers. Uh, obviously, the three placers are West Shore guys. The one that really stood out to me was Ethan Timar knocked off a uh, former Fargo champ and Javon Yarbrough. Gus came up to me and he's like, he's going to go after him right away and he's going to wilt him. And he did that. Timar's a freshman. He's a kid you've always been high on and always have talked to me about. What's it like to see Ethan Timar jump right in and place at the Ironman for you? Well, he's actually a sophomore. A he, sophomore? Uh, yeah, he was a green team guy last year. But remember, Gus was a green team guy his freshman year, state champion, a sophomore year. I think Ethan Timar is going to take the same path. 
And it's a really good, uh, it's a really good lesson for parents to understand. I mean, you, you might not, you might not be in that lineup your freshman year. You might not be a four-time state champion, but you're set up really good after that. Ethan Tmar is going to make a lot of noise. That kid's a competitor. I mean, he is, he looks like a sweet little kid that he, but that kid's mean and that kid can wrestle and don't ever count him out. I mean, don't count, don't put your money against that kid. He looked really good in the matches that I saw. I think he ended up fourth. Fourth, yeah. Took fourth. Yeah. Uh, Jarrell Miller. Jarrell Miller was a runner up. Jarrell is tougher than a $2 steak. Uh, super entertaining to watch. Come from behind, win in the semifinals. He runs into pound for pound, in my opinion. Probably the number one wrestler in the country in Rocco Welsh, Ohio State guy. Boy versus a man there. I think that Jarrell even talked about the, the power was such a big difference for him. But having Jarrell and Ty, their twins, sophomores, come through your program, what was it like coaching those guys at St. Ed, at uh, West Shore? They were terrible. They were <laughs> terrible. I mean, they became – I mean, they were in my room since they were five years old. And they became, they were a pain in the ass for <sighs> nine years. Their eighth grade year, they decided to get serious and they just whooped uh. everybody. Um, and then <laughs> and then they took off from there. Yeah, by no means were they role models in the room until their eighth grade year. And and we and we joke about it, you know, um, when we coach CYO, there's a guy, coach, old time guy named uh, Tin Convery, um, old coach Urbis guy, you know, one of his friends and everything. And and I was struggling with coming from Cleveland State coaching to coaching CYO. And there's some jack in the box kid in the room or whatever. And, and Tim Conrad is like, God, you can never give up on a kid. Just can never give up on a kid. And you know, that was that guy's message in life to me. That always stuck with me. So I mean, the trials and tribulations with these Miller brothers for years. I always went back to Tim Conrad. Don't give up on a kid, don't give up on a kid, and sure. Sure as heck, these kids, they really turned it on and, you know, did a great job and are doing a great job. And believe me, I mean, they're going to have to, they're going to have to crack down on their books. They're not too happy with that. Um, they're going to have to do some work there, but um, they will. And and there's going to be big time programs looking for them. Their, their bodies are perfect. They're long, lean builds, you know, probably going to withstand a lot of, um, a lot of hard work. They're, they're going to be good. And they're going to, they're going to pick the college they want to go to. I think that Ty, once he figures it out, he's going to figure out he can be just as good as Drell, in my opinion. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Exactly. And then I mean, it's to let you know how good those kids really were. I had Kerry Cole on in here, and this was when they were just freshmen going into high school. And they're Kerry, they were eighth graders actually. Yeah. He's like, who are those two? And you know, when you when you catch Kerry Cole out Ty at a, a youth scrim or youth clinic. You know you're doing you're doing something right. I just like they are super impressive. Me, you know what I really like about them? They're nice kids. They're nice kids, and uh, I don't think their dad puts up with much. <laughs> no, he's, he's a hardcore Cleveland policeman. He he's a he's a pretty solid dude. He's a real solid dude. He's a SWAT guy. Yeah, well, he first came to when he first came. He came to uh, West Shore because of police because he, you know the policemen send their kids to me. And he said, I'm gonna tell you right now, my kids are not wrestling for St. Ed's. I'm not dealing with it. He's a Garfield guy. Like, we're not wrestling for St. Ed's. We'll wrestle for you, but don't even think about it. No, that didn't last very long. You know, he yeah, drank the Kool Aid. Because JT is actually he wrestled for Garfield Heights, then Cleveland State, right? Yeah, exactly. So we have a little history there. So, okay, just real quick, talk about how you get the police officers and the firefighters and talk about the West Park connection. And why everybody lived in West Park when you were a police officer? Give me the history on why that why you know, Coach Heffernan still lives in West Park, I believe. Um, but why did everybody live in West Park who was a police officer and a fireman in Cleveland? Because yeah, because we had residency. So um, you know the nicest parts of the city are, you know, historically the, the closest ones to the suburbs, and you know West Park borders Fairview there, and um, you know Lakewood. And it's right along the valley there. It's a really nice place to live. Um, you know, Gus, David Habit, and Nick Salzer all lived within a half a mile of each other in West Park. They're, we're all city, they're all um, kids of city workers. So residency forced us all into the same parish, basically. And they all grew up together. 
I mean, that's three really solid kids that lived, you know, within blocks of each other. Um, but yeah, then and then West Park has its own kind of pride in itself. You know, it's if you meet people from West Park, they they have no problem, you know, telling you that they're, that's where they're from and they're proud of it. The west side of West Park is the big joke, right? Because that's like the neighborhood where all the firemen and the police all actually lived, right? Yeah, and if you like you live on 130th and you say you're from West Park, you're like, yeah, no, you're not West Park. West Park is west of 150th. You know, it's it's kind of funny how it kind of goes. West, uh, what what is the actual West Hunt? What's the actual cross street? Puritus, Puritus is West Park, right? Yeah, it goes it goes all the way down to the airport. You know, um, all the way down to Brook Park Road. So it goes from Brook Park to Lake, all the way up to Lakewood. Um, and then it goes basically to 150. It, it goes to 130th. But like I said, those of us on the 150th side don't count the 130th people. <laughs> so Nick Nemeth is actually, he's a West Park guy as well. And he's got a lot of pride in it. I remember when we were in college, Gus, and he's a St. Ed's guy or guy. When, when we were in college, guy, they announced him at the MAC tournament as being from Parma, Ohio. And I didn't get it at the time. He like he's a pretty low key guy, but he's like he got super mad about it, and it was right before the finals, and he like kind of lost his mind. And he was a mean guy when he wrestled, and he really kind of mangled the guy. It was a Central Michigan guy. He beat the guy up. Was trying to hurt the guy, and I was like, "Hey man, what was the problem?" Because they announced I was from Parma, and that's the funny joke. Him and this other WWE guy. The other WWE guy's name's Miz. He's literally from Parma, and I'm always like, "Wait, wait, you're from Parma. Miz is from Cleveland," and he he laughs at it. But I never realized how much pride there was in West Park, the West Side of Cleveland. So, like, you know, getting talking to you and then being teammates with him, and it's all very clear and apparent to me now. Um, yeah. When, when did that real- rule? When that rule go away with the city of Cleveland and the the city employees living in Cleveland? Probably around 2005 ish, somewhere around there. But you didn't, you didn't leave right away, though. You stayed through Gus. You guys didn't leave until, what, yeah, 2015 I, or something? Yeah, I didn't have any money. I couldn't. I got divorced. I was wiped out, you know. I I lived in Cleveland because I had to at that point. Looks like things are going well for you now. Yeah, picked a good <laughs> wife. Oh, that's amazing. So, Ash, I'm telling you right now, we can't give, we cannot heap enough praise on to Ashley Seiko. She's awesome. Um, where's Ashley from? What well, she's from 130th, she's 130th in Lorraine. She's from West Park too. Well, I'm, I don't <laughs> consider it West Park. She considers West Park. 130th in Lorraine. <laughs> she's from. <laughs> she's not from the west side of West Park, is what you're telling me. No, she's the east side of West Park. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. Okay. So um, the pride in West Park is obviously huge. And then Lakewood is even further west of of that, correct? No, it's north. It's, I'm sorry. It's dead north up up like the Jennings Freeway. Almost. Uh, Jennings Freeway well, is more east. 117th. Lakewood starts at 117th and runs to the river. Is it Cleveland, Cleveland runs to the river, too. The river kind of zigzags up there. Gotcha. Rocky River. So, I want to say Bunce Road, Warren Bunce. Is that right? Yeah, those are roads that go north and yeah, south. Yeah, when it, they, they're that's Bunce is 140th turn. It turns into Bunce and Lakewood. Warren's gotcha. 150th. It turns north into Lakewood. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm close, yeah. right? I'm close. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I love the pride that they, the furious pride that you guys have in West Park. It's like it's awesome to see the like loyalty for it and where people are from, and it's just like kind of cool. The West Side of West Park and the the fire and the police. Um. I just had a, a fireman come into my classroom. I teach career classes and he teaches at the Glenville station. I'm sorry. He, oh, he, nice. he does fire. He's first grade firefighter FGF at uh, West park. Shout out to CJ Hayes. So I saw half this weekend coach half. And I was like, Hey, I just had a guest speaker in. He teach or he's a coach or he's a FGF first grade firefighter at Glenville. And half's like, Oh yeah, I was there for 17 years. And he's like, that's a great station to be at when you're a young man. Um, CJ Hayes said and half confirmed, he said they're they're going on fire runs. They're they're not, there's little to no downtime at that station. And sure. you that was kind was that near where you actually I started were? out at East 93rd and Kinsman. A little worse. Oh, but man. it was a good oh, place man. to be a policeman, you know. 
Not wow. much temptation at 93rd and Kinsman to get you in trouble. You just wow. kind of worked. That's that. Listen, you guys, but when I talk to guys like you, I talk to CJ Hayes, when I talk to half as a young person that keeps you on your toes being around places like that. And there's a lot of action. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, yeah. I went and traded for a while. We, we worked through our vacations. We want to take a day off. They're like, wow. uh, you got, you know, we'd have like a three day weekend. It, 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 you rotate, you work six days in a row and then you would work. Then you get a three day weekend and you, the way you did. But then when you're, they call it a three bagger. When your three bagger came up, you're like, Oh man, I got to miss a day. You know, you, you didn't want to take the days off or you would work straight through your vacation. I went 13 years without missing a day of work as a policeman. Do you miss being a police officer compared to running a rare warehouse and a global business that ships all over the world? The, the only thing that I uh, miss about being a policeman is laughing. Policemen laugh a lot. I mean, it's, you laugh hard. And I, and I think that might be like a, it might be a defense mechanism. Who knows why, but I mean, it, just kind of a twisted sense of humor, but you, you miss, you miss, you know, the busting of the balls and the, and the laughing like that. But what I what I do here is much bigger than um, what I do. I mean, sure, as a policeman, you do things and you save people, and uh, you honestly do. But um, here, I I reach way more people. You know, I reach people all, all around the world. Yeah, there's no question about that. Especially for my family and I, is this weekend I was at Ironman, of course, uh, promoting, handing out product that you give me, <clears throat> and. Uh, I think I gave Chris Perry some, Willie Saylor, a couple other coaches, Coach Dylan from Lehigh. And, and um, I don't know how much they use the product, right? Because that's always my thing is I'm trying to reach people and give them an opportunity to, to try the product. Um, the wipes, the packaged wipes, you know, the not, 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 com you know, these are good, but those individual package wipes are my favorite thing. I've told you how those have bailed me out of the grease and a lot of sticky situations. Stinky situations, I guess I should say. But long and the short of it is they were like, hey, do you use this stuff? I said, I wash my kids with this every night. I wash my kids with defense soap every night. I don't know if there's a more ringing endorsement for a product when I take the things that are the two most important things in my life to me and I put your product on them every night. And I, and I, well, I'm in the point now, Ferd washes himself, right? He's seven. He's going to be seven next, uh, next in two months. But Thomas, I wash Thomas, and I've always washed Ferd. I've always washed them with Defense Soap. Is there a more ringing endorsement than that right there for someone using your product, would you say? No, no, and I really appreciate that. But the, the promise that I, you know, I use that, I developed that for my kids. That's And that's why it's the quality that it is. I, I read the ingredients. If you want to shock yourself, read the ingredients in a bar soap, look up, and then put type it in a computer, and then type in side effects. You will, you'll lose your mind. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to make a bar of soap that kids are going to use. My own kids are going to use this. I cannot have, I can't be responsible for putting this on kids. So I developed the, you know, the purest bar of soap that I could. And it, you know, it really worked out. That was before green was a thing, you know, or natural or whatever. Yeah. There's no, nothing bad in that, in that product. It's good. This for one, this one isn't my jam. My number one. Within my arm's reach, I can't even tell you how much I can grab. I got old bottles here. Your peppermint. Part, pardon the old bottles. You know peppermint's my thing. You know that. You give me the peppermint by the gallon. These are the old bottles that I keep on hand. I travel with old bottles. For me personally, I just I always keep refilling them. I travel with old bottles. And then this is oatmeal. You know, peppermint, as you know, is my favorite. But, like, I don't feel any snake oil. Whenever I'm handing out stuff and talking about your product and brought to you by Defense Soap, I don't feel that at all. That's what I love about it. And I know that obviously anybody that I've ever given it to, you know, most of those people and the goal is that they're now buying it, right? We want them to buy the product. You just don't get a, you just don't get free lifetime Defense Soap. We want you to buy it. And I think that that speaks to the product. I think that that speaks to how good the product is and why you give free promotions out to people, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I always tell Charlie, Charlie fights me on that sometimes. I'm like, listen, if you can't give it away, and if you don't believe in giving it away to, to get a customer, then we're not we're not doing the right thing. I mean, I give so many samples away, but those people become customers. And this is interesting. One skew on my original bar, just my original bar, I sold 30,000 of those this month on Amazon. Just one skew. 
of the original bar, 30,000 pieces. That's not counting the other 20 SKUs in my line. That that bar, you know, it's a lot of a lot of work. I, I love that you guys guarantee your product. I mean, you're right here. People are able to reach out to you. You got a number. You've got everything. It's like awesome. If people got if information, you got the website. This, do you ever get people saying, "Hey, your product sucks"? Do you ever get that? Well, you could you could go on Amazon and read read the reviews. Um, it's a basically a four point six star product on Amazon. Um, the the product is, and I shouldn't sound braggadocious, but the product is so good. Procter and Gamble called me up to have me test a bottle for them, a package for them, because they said, we know that the, if there's any complaints on this, it's not going to be your product. It's going to be the new package that we did. So, I mean, even Procter and Gamble went through and, and looked at the reviews and chose, chose that soap. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Ferdinand loves to smell the wipes. He takes it out and he just smells the wipes and he rubs himself down and smell. He just like, Oh, I love the smell of it. And I know if you, I know you know that I do a ton of promotion for you. I'm always promoting. It's always go mode, right? Um, but the the Bomber Wrestling Club here at Kenston, Jeff Varney, um, they their kids. They I don't know if you saw it, but Jeff's wife hands them out after practice. They got the the big 500 count, the pail, and the kids all wiped down after practice. You know, because they're not showering there, they're driving home. And his wife That's hands him out, right? I mean, that tells you a lot. So, like, I'm always shooting videos of that. Um, they got the defense soap wrestler of the week at Kenston that they give to their, you know, two best kids at each level each week. And, um, you know, he believes in the product, too. Your sign's on there, uh, on the wall. At what point, though, is it hard to for you to say no to people? Because everyone's always asking. Everybody's always wanting from you. How? At what point is it, like, I got to say no this time. It doesn't seem like you ever do that. I, I had to put Charlie in charge of that um, because I, I do tend to say no more than I should. I mean, I say yes more than I should. Um, and, I, and I had Charlie actually um, look at it more of a, a business, but then I overruled Charlie on most of them anyways. But, you know, I just have Charlie balance some things out for me. He, he's really good at um, if we give you something we – want you to give us something back in return you know not i'm not talking about your normal consumer like but i'm talking like if we sponsor a program or something you know it, it's tough sponsoring programs because our our um our business is programs so we can't give soap to every single program you know so we'll sponsor a tournament we'll sponsor an event that they have but then we want something back in in return you know i tell you what kenston believes in the product right out here bomber wrestling club jeff varney is like all in on you guys. Uh, how's their How's their skin? It's great. They don't have the outbreaks are few and far in between. Um, there's weird ones though. That there was a weird one that was going through. I don't think they had it at our program really. I saw a rash of crazy the molluscum contagiosum outbreak. Yeah. It wasn't really at their program last year. I don't think there's anything that you guys can really do about that because it's this crazy virus, right? Well, what is interesting about that is that virus has a three-year life. It runs for three years, um, but there's no real research on it. Try to find research on what prevents it. You can't really find any re research on it. Um, our, our soap you know, and our sprays have antiviral properties, but I mean, for me to sit here and tell you that, yeah, we're going to prevent that, it would be irresponsible. I mean, just because the research is not there. Um, and that stuff spreads like wildfire. You got to burn it off or freeze it off. You know, you really yeah, don't want to yeah. do it. Yeah, you can't do much with molluscum except for run it, run its course, or it's got to get frozen off, like you said, and it's or it got to get burned off. So it's it's a really bad situation. And like you said, it can be anywhere from six to like thirty six months. Yeah, it's a long. It's, it has a long cord. It's crazy. Um, when you guys are in the process, um. Like you said, before everybody was into the green movement and holistic medicine, right? You guys were kind of in that that market for so long. And then it came to a point where you were like, I got to take the FDA on. And you started adding ingredients and had an antifungal and an actual medical soap. What was that jump like for you in research and development to jump into the medicated soap market? 
it, it, was, it was a pretty interesting thing, actually. In order to, what happened was there's so many holistic companies on the market making bogus claims. You got to be careful. You got to be careful of what the claims. You can't mislead mislead people. You can't be. I mean, they'll tell, people will tell you it cures cancer and all all this stupid stuff, right? So the FDA has to start to crack down on on these companies. Well, my product is holistic, and it actually does kill ringworm. So how do I how do I get that message out legally, right? So what I did was I created. Uh, I took the same bar of soap and I put an FDA approved medicine in it and I ran it through the FDA and they, and they approved it. And now that bar is actually my biggest, I told you I sold 30,000 other ones. That's my most profitable skew is that medicated bar. Um, and, and there's other people trying to knock that off. Now there's other people that think uh, it's, it, it was a good idea. There's other people in wrestling that are trying it now. Uh, but now I got to rely upon my branding and and my being first to market and just out hustling everybody to stay where we're at. Um, but uh, that that's one of the very first ever antifungal bars on the market. People still don't really understand the need for it until you get a fungal infection. And then you go look for the defense, you know, antifungal bar. It's an OTC. It's an over-the-counter medicine. It's a really good bar. I just had something on my wrist right here. Guess what? Guess what? Gone. Used it. Let it sit on for a minute, sometimes two minutes. That's the other thing. I think people just think they can rub something on them and not let it activate, not let them actually do what it does. You can't just rinse soap off right away and expect to get clean, right? No, it's got to get to give it time to break down the organism and kill it. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome for me. So thank you for that. And I keep it separate in its own dish. That's very important to keep it in its own dish, right? Well, it's because it's a medicine. So once you take a bar of soap out of the box, you throw it away, you don't really, you know, you lose the identity of it. So we, we put it in that medicated dish so people know, hey, this is a medicine. I mean, it's not going to hurt you to use it every day. It won't hurt you at all. But why? You don't need to use it every day. Use the bar that's half the price. You know, you don't need to use an expensive one every day. So so this one right here, why was the $6 price point, why was it such a sticking point for you? You still largely sell these for six dollars, right? And if you see it for nine dollars, that means somebody bought it from you and they marked it up, right? We'll never sell that. That bar will never be more than five ninety nine. That goes back to um, again. I'm um, a blue collar guy. I was raised with blue collar family, and you know, I my parents were not the most supportive type parents. You know, they didn't have the money to be super supportive. And I remember I, I came home with a Wellington Pee Wee wrestling um, flyer and I asked my dad if I could sign up for it. Look at how much did it cost? And it was $6 for a wrestling season, you know? And that $6 actually um, changed the entire course of my life, you know? It and, ended up being, you know, I ended up going to college, again, got into police force after college, coached, you know, and then I started this company. So, you know, we, we, we keep to our roots. That's our $6 pledge that that bar will never. That bar will never cost as much as my first wrestling season. You know, I'll keep it under the under that six dollar mark. I don't know if you do much. I don't know. I guess paying attention to the economy and inflation, but that's yeah. a hard ask. That's yeah, not it's... easy. I know. I know you pay attention, and I know you know what your what your profit point is. Right. That's a hard thing for you to keep that and say that. How are you going to be able to do that as, as you know, where the dollar just becomes devalued and the price of everything else goes up? Well, the, the way I did it, I always say it's good to be an uneducated Polish policeman because I, you figure out things like the hard way, right? Well, when I started my company, I was buying 10,000 bars of soap, the minimum order, you know, and, and they were expensive. You know, you know how it is if you buy things in quantity between – when you're buying 10,000 something or 150,000 or something, 10,000 of them are a lot more expensive. I My my business model was based on 10,000 bars, all right? So now I buy 150,000. When I say buy, I have 150,000 made at a time, okay? So basically I'm buying them. Um, so I have 150,000 made. Over the, over the course of the years, my price of the bar has gone down as volume went up. So I was able to profit on the back end and keep my price. Um, I'm not greedy. I mean, I could have raised the price all along and just had a huge profit margin or the whole way through. 
but I kept the price of the bar the same and I made money on the backside as my volume went up. And my business model is based off of the most expensive bar. So it's all gravy in, in there. During the pandemic, you guys were in the middle of a really unique move. You left what I call the screw factory in Lakewood, right? Is that a good name for what that yeah, building? That, yeah, Lakewood Screw Factory. The screw factory. So you left the, the, the screw factory in Lakewood and you moved out to the state-of-the-art facility in Vermilion, Ohio, where you're currently sitting in the front office right now, literally the front office. And it was dirt. It was right as the pandemic hit. How were you able to keep it together? And your business went crazy and skyrocketed because everybody needed, they needed, they needed soap. Everybody needed soap, right? How did you keep it all together and stay as one cohesive unit, how you guys did it? Well, it was pretty amazing. I mean, the, the very, it's hard to believe this, but March 20th, the very first email I got sitting down at my desk was state of Ohio is closed for business. And I was like, the very first email, I just sat down on my brand new desk and my, well, it's actually a used desk, but my brand new office with my brand new used desk and <laughs> first email open up was don't, don't go outside. Business is closed. So I call my my mayor, the mayor of Vermilion, Jim Forthover. I'm like, hey, Jim, they just shut down Ohio. I said, I haven't sold one product out of this. I just just moved in. Within 15 minutes, he calls me back. I called uh, Erie County Health. They're requiring you to stay open. Even though I'm in Lorain County, Erie County governs Lorain County's Board of Health. So because Vermilion's in two town, two two counties. I didn't know so, that. Yeah, we're in two counties. So the we're actually in Lorraine County, the Erie County controls that part of it. They're like, no, they're they're requesting that you stay open since you sell disin, you know, soap. And then we got into this, the disinfectants. We actually had them, but they got really busy during that time when no one could get anything else. Talk about this. Talk about this container. I have round ones, right? Why is this the container? For the soap and talk about what Procter and Gamble did to you guys and what you learned about supply chains and what you learned about where you're in the packing order with with some of these other Procter and Gambles and massive companies. Yeah, we, we were absolutely nobody. Um, you know, we, we would make we would get our we make the wipes here, but you have to buy all the components and, and put it together here. And one of the, well, two of the components, the, the wipes are in a roll and they're, they're rolled up and they're perforated for you. And then, then you got to soak them and, you know, put them, have them in the canister. You put them canisters first and you soak them. But we couldn't get the cloth and we couldn't get the canisters. The company that was making our wipes for us got bought out by Procter & Gamble. They took the whole line. So the whole line was shut down. We had two suppliers and they were both shut down. So during during the pandemic, we we had to become resourceful and find new packaging we had to find cloth it's not easy to find yeah and that 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 kind of saved us for a while um you know we we get those made two hundred fifty thousand at a time i i don't i don't make those in house i don't have the machines to do that i have the machines to make the other wipes but i don't have those so that helped that bridge the gap for a while until we're able to find a new supplier but try to find a wipe supplier in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> you know you just have to, you just nope. have to be you know, try to find a plastic supplier in the middle of a pandemic. So, I mean, those were the things we did, but it made us a better company. We got a better quality cl cloth out of it. That container fits better into packaging. I mean, in backpacks and everything, we just used the opportunity to become a better company. This one right here, this packaged white, this one count white, this has so much more, uh, it feels like it's uh, like a, a bigger, more, more moist white. For me personally, I handed some over to uh, Corey Haddad, the director of the Iron Man, and he couldn't believe it. They they were like, "Wow, that really is." Will this go away now that the pandemic's over and the supply chain issues, or will you continue to hold these these singles? No, the people love those. Um, they're they're about four times as expensive. I, I it's just I can't I just can't get them cheaper than what they are. Um, but they're about four times as expensive, and I'll, I'll have them on the table and people buy a canister and then the mom always grabs a pack for her bag. You know, they always grab a pack. They know they're more expensive. They don't care. They like them. And believe it or not, they'll that those will last 10 years 
in that foil wrap. It won't now, have an opportunity here to do that because I use the do. tar out of these because the thing about this, right? The thing about this, like you're saying, it keeps put throwing this in your bag. I'm telling you, this has bailed me out of the grease in multiple national parks. Uh, this past summer in the Redwoods, it bailed me out of the grease. A couple, like 2019, the Rocky Mountain National Park, it bailed me out of the grease. These bailed me out of the grease. thing about these is if this gets compromised, these will dry out sometimes. Yeah, we, put, then, 11, we put 11 full ounces in there. We oversaturate that cloth. It can't hold anymore, but we do that on purpose just in case you do get a crack in the lid. So those aren't coming back because they're dry. I mean, if they're dry, they, they really got abused. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but you got to remember, these are going in wrestlers' bags. They're going to get abused. Yeah. I The one, the only one I've ever cracked like that was a round one, and it was on my the back of my four-wheeler for when I was out. I would If I got poison ivy me, I had me, I would wipe it off, which isn't the, the greatest fix and what it's for, but it would work, and it would give me time to get in and use soap and water, hot water, and get it off of me. And uh, it got crushed by a chainsaw, and that's what happened when, it, when that one dried out. I don't think you're designing it to get crushed by a chainsaw on the back of a four wheeler, are you? No, but actually, sometimes they could overcook those lids and they become fragile. So when we get a batch of lids, and we'll actually go back there and try to crush them in our hands. Yeah, you know, and if they're flexible, then they're acceptable. If I could crush it in my hand, then we, we send them back. Okay, so pandemic story time. Yeah, you, that was saved, a you saved another company in I want to say in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I, I kind of, sometimes I wish I almost didn't do that because you know, I'm still sitting on three skids of hand sanitizer that I can't get rid of that I got to pay to get rid of. Um, but you know, it's again, it 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 helped people out in a pinch. People need a hand sanitizer. That company was shut down if they weren't making hand sanitizer, so it was okay. But then I got caught holding the bag on that. But eh, live and learn, right? But that one was a it was a women's cosmetic company, wasn't it? They were making makeup. And they changed over their tooling to that, that product right there, right? Yeah. So you so, actually helped keep another industry alive all the way across the country on the West Coast. I understand that you got stuck with three pallets, but for what it was, I think that that was an excellent move for you. At least PR, you and I are talking about it right now, aren't we? Yeah. And then again, we're, we're a small enough company where we could adapt to those things. That was developed in like a week. That's wild. That you know is I mean? wild to me. Throw the label on it and send it out, you know. Okay. So you do have another kind of niche market besides wrestling, the combat, combative sports, uh, MMA. And then um, I know Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a big one and grappling, right? What is yep. it like? What are the two communities like dealing with, Guy? Uh, the two different communities? Yeah. Uh, I like wrestlers a lot better. Um, and I have to be careful I say that because they're all my customers. But – um, everybody in jujitsu wants a sponsorship. Everybody wants something for free in jujitsu. Um, I have quite a few jujitsu schools that buy from me and they're really, um, they're really good customers. And, you know, they're, I call them my Christmas trees. Uh, you know, like how during the summertime you sell swimming pools and in the wintertime they sell Christmas trees. Jujitsu guys are my Christmas trees. Um, they used to be a joke, but now they're a really good part of my business, you know, um, the, the people in jiu-jitsu, everybody wants a sponsor, uh, where wrestlers don't all want sponsors. You know, wrestlers are more like they're going to grind it out, and it's a, it's a little it's a little different philosophy. Um, they're good they're good customers, and I have a I have a good respect for you know those top tier jiu-jitsu guys. They're they're really tough guys too. Believe me, they're they're every bit as tough as a you know NCAA champion. Um, uh, it's just a different culture. One one is a little more um, wanting than the other. One expects to pay and to, you know, they expect good service, but they expect to pay for it. The other one wants, you know, more things given to them. And that's just a, that's culturally why we're different in general. You know what I mean? It's, I think that, that 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 can be expected. I think you probably do a pretty good job of balancing that. And or delegating to Charlie would be my guess. Yeah. Well, Charlie has like, now when someone wants to be sponsored by us, Charlie, you have to have a minimum of 10,000 followers on Instagram. He, he has a system set up where, you know, he's he's good at delegating, you know, that. Well, that goes on eyeballs. That goes on, like, what are you exposing us to, guys? 
What are you taking? Where are you taking us? What new markets are you putting me into? I think that's your big thing because I go all over and I'm always taking your product with me and I'm taking it to new markets where people might not know it. And I think that that's the biggest thing I got going. I mean, I'm always trying to promote it to people even outside of wrestling because I think that the product's that good. But yeah, you have to have some type of threshold for people. Like, why are you, why are we working with you? What are you giving to us? Like you said, it's a, it's a two way street. All right. Or you go out of business. <laughs> yeah. You go out of business. Uh, I, you know, I can't say enough good, great things about the product and I talk about the product and what you guys have done for me and my family. I just, I, I, yeah, I'm, I love it. I remember, uh, I picked up the, uh, I picked up the, uh, boxes of it with from one day from the loading dock in Lakewood. Do you remember my little maroon Toyota truck? Yeah, I'm not sure how it got there, but yeah. <laughs> so you made fun of my truck, and then you're like, Dub, this is, are you serious with this truck? And then with what you guys paid me, I was able to go buy a new truck. That's did awesome. You did you know that? No, I'm glad you got a new truck. You, you effectively bought me a new truck for the Good. work that we did together. I was able to get an F-150 truck that I love, and I don't look like uh, like a – a shady dude driving around in a little tiny uh, rusted out Toyota truck that I paid a thousand dollars for. So shout out to you guys for hooking me up with a new truck. And obviously once again, there was, you know, there was a, a give and take there. It was a two way street, but I got a new truck with the money you guys paid me. So thank you. Well, you worked for, you earned it. I, I would agree with that statement. Um, All right. On to the duels. Let's talk about the duels. Let's talk about the new defense. soap duels. Who can we expect to see as top teams? Who's coming out of Pennsylvania? Who are we going to see that's going to be new at the defense of duels? And what is our new location? First off, what's our new location for the defense of duels? Well, we're, we're back at Cedar Point. We were at Cedar Point. Well, usually we're at Cleveland State, but Cleveland State got wacky during the pandemic, all that stuff. So we had so we went to Cedar Point. Then Cedar Point booked on us, so we ended up at Spire. And now we're back at Cedar Point again. So okay. it's it jumped around a little bit over the years, but I don't think I'm being rude looking at my phone, but I have notes in my phone on, on the teams coming in here. Um, the the top three teams I'll look for this year are going to be Quest, Jamaica Lee's team, Palmer's team, or 922 out of uh, down by Southern Ohio. Those are those are the three teams that are going to going to be pretty good. Um, we have teams from – let me jump up here – Obviously, Tennessee. We uh, ten, National Catholic. We they, have, listen. Is that Vince Joyola? Yeah, Vince. Yeah, he's a he's a Solon guy. Yeah, Vince is a Solon guy. Is Sky bringing his team from nine two two, Coach Sky? Yes, Sky is going to be there. Um, a Maryland team is going to be there. We got BTW. Wait um, a minute. Wait a minute. What is that Maryland team called? Terps. The Terps team. Oh, okay. So you guys were kind of. You had guys that were on that Terps team at National Middle School Duels, right? Yeah, it's not my favorite situation, but it is what it is. So we have uh, BTW, Palmer, Terps, Neighborhood, now Hurley's, the Hurley's. Yes. And the reason why the Hurley's are in there, and the reason why the tournament went from 12 to 16 is because, again, during the pandemic, we had teams bail out on us. We still wanted to have the tournament. We kind of run this thing underground type deal. We called a team bell on us last minute. And it, it was really awkward to have like 11 teams. You know, how do you do 11 teams? So I called up the Hurleys. I said, hey, could you guys fill a spot for us? They're like, yeah, we're going to get killed. But, yeah, we really want to get in there. So any team that was ever in it in the past is allowed to come back in. So we had replacement teams. And then, of course, like Vince couldn't make it because of – whatever reason, but Vince wants back in now that we're back in Cedar Point. So we went back and forth in that. So we ended up with 16 teams. Um, we had North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland. It's it's a pretty good it's a pretty good um field. Now like Bassets won't be this year because they're in high school winning the Iron Man and stuff like that. So I mean even that that level is not going to be there, but there's always there's always going to be you know, four-time national champions have wrestled in this tournament. This is this is by no means an easy tournament. Um, it 
the field is a little different than it has been in the past, but I'm still expecting it to be pretty challenging. Astron brought his team down at one year at Cleveland State. Um, like you said, the Bassets, the Ranger Pro, Ranger Pride Wrestling, uh, the Young Guns type team, they've been down. Listen, I wouldn't be shocked if Keegan Bassett showed up. Keegan uh, is an eighth grader, uh, seventh grader this year, and he will eventually be at McCourt where they are now with the team they have now. But in the past, I mean, Bo Bassett, Mason Gibson, they've come down. Um, Melvin Miller has come down to this tournament. Um, Tommy Virouette has been at the tournament. Last year's tournament at Spire, well, I love the finals. You guys were in the finals last year. Yeah, we got blown out. They're really good, guy. Jesus, Pete, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, we had, well, it's interesting about you mentioned Askren. Askren always got on me about having the little guys in there. He's like, we don't need little guys. It's not right to have these little guys wrestling. And, you know, I disagree with them. I, you know, he may be, you know, NCAA champion and UFC guy, but I, I'm a better youth coach than he is. I'm going to tell you that right now. And he's, he's like, you know, we don't need this kid. It's not right. Well, I see his five-year-old kid is wrestling now. It's like, well, what changed? You know, now wrestling is okay for a little kid. To a five-year-old. Give me a break. Well, the thing about that is if you don't do that, then Max doesn't get the wrestle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and now he's doing the same thing with his kid. So I can't wait to get him on the phone and say, oh, now you want the 50-pounders back in the tournament because you got a 50-pounder. I'm going to ask him what weight his kid is. When he tells me his kid's 55, he said the first weight class will be 60. Just so he knows what it feels like. <laughs> okay. So what was the, the what was the, uh, the philosophy of bringing the Cleveland duels back and making the defensive duels? Uh, I just wanted, I just wanted a good solid tournament at home where um, my kids could wrestle without having to travel. We travel a lot. I mean, everybody does obviously, but I'm like, I want a hand picked, tournament somebody called us it was interesting the other day it's like one of the best underground tournaments in the country no you can't watch it on flow you can't get the results it drives people absolutely bonkers but i think that's kind of part of the uh allure of the whole thing you know it's just like you you'll shoot some of the matches and stuff but it's it's you know it's pretty pretty hard to get a hold of them they're not watching them live that's for sure or did you do it live last year i did the finals live last year i'll probably do the semis and the finals it depends how we're set up there. Are we just going into pools and then the winners of the pool? Like, I don't know what we're going to do. It's, it's, you this year, it's, um, yeah, and that's the other thing. It changes every year. So yeah. it depends on how we have it. We have um four pools of four. And then, so you get three matches there and then we'll break them out into four more pools. So you're going to get six matches. So what I'll do is I'll film all the gold pool, all the gold pool matches. I'll do all those matches, every match and all the gold pool. Right. And then, Probably all the West Shore matches, all the top three schools, you, teams you just said. I'll try and get all their matches because then everybody's getting – they're getting uh, the ability to see themselves on – and I'll try and do probably two or three live matches because I have that ability. Um, I can just stream it right on GoHioCast from my phone, and it shoots an HD image, and I'll, I'll, I'll commentate probably two or three of them and obviously get highlights of matches, but – I'll get every West Shore match. Every West Shore match will be on Go Ohio Cast, right? Well, we, um, we do like the under underground um, feel to it, though. Oh well, yeah, but last year I shot every match. Yeah, it was a lot on me though. That was a lot on me. Um, okay, I want to finish up with two two other things with you. You guys have a partnership through Flow Wrestling, Flow Wrestling, right? And you have had a pri previous partnership with them, and then you have a current partnership. Are you guys getting the return on what you want? And do you like what they're doing with a lot of these different series that you guys are sponsoring through Flow Wrestling? Yeah, um, we work with um, Shane Sparks. You know Shane Sparks? Love Big Shane. Time. Love Shane Sparks. Yeah, well, he's our – we have an assigned guy, too, at Flow, and it's Shane Sparks. So, I mean, you know me. I always get in fights with people. And, um, you know, me and Martin didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. We went back and forth a few times. So they bring in, like, Martin's out of there. They bring in Shane. They got a – I think USA USA Today, a guy from USA Today came over, kind of helping them with their marketing. A lot of big changes there. They put, a, like, a guy in between me and them. So then we could actually um, we could actually work out some deals. We, we worked out some really sweet deals. One of the things that I really pushed for, and this is – this is where we're being a wrestler helps in a wrestling business. 
is we are on, we have the skin, the outside skin of the hydration page. So you know how people have to go and certify for hydration? Every single wrestler in this country, whatever whatever team run, has to certify through a page that says defense soap on it. I mean, we reach every single wrestling program because of that. Um, it just just little things like that we we worked out with them. We have an email blast with them coming up this week. I, I mean, it's it's a pretty good thing. I really value that partnership. I value the um, um, Big Ten partnership, and we have, we have a licensing agreement that we're um, nailing with the UFC right now. We're working out. We're going to make UFC soap. Um, so we're, we're kind of that's still in the works, but that's going to be a global um, partnership with them, and who knows where that's going to go. So we got some, we have some, you know, pretty big things in the hopper right now. Where does that come from when you get to the UFC? Is that a Joe Rogan connection? Because I know Joe Rogan it loves defense soap. He talks about you. I wish you'd say your name right. Cause you Sako. Yeah. Cause you Sako. I know you're not going to correct him. him. I'm correcting him. It's Guy Seiko. Just so we're just so we're clear, Joe. I know he'll be watching this, but um. That's just, you know what I mean? How does that come to be when you get a partner like UFC or a potential partnership? How does that come to be, guy? Just a lot of work. I mean, we've been around 17 years. Fighters use us. We're really the only game in town that has medicated soaps, you know, that are uh, approved by the UWW, approved by the FDA. So, I mean, it's not like we're not we're not selling snake oil. Not that we ever did, but we're not selling snake snake oil we could put down on the table this is our research this is a, you know our registrations or over-the-counter medicines we we could do that we're a serious player there um obviously our niche is limited it's not a huge niche but we're the only player in town so when they which is actually kind of good because when they come to us to negotiate we sell soap to combat athletes we're not selling nike tennis shoes so i could always negotiate things on a on a reasonable level even with the ufc could because we're the only one in the category you know i don't have 45 other companies trying to sell t-shirts in the same category it's just us so we can we can negotiate that and then we're in a negotiation process right now is that something charlie got you got who was the person who was the conduit between you and the uh the ufc well the way it really started was um a company called me up and said we need we want to know if you can make a cbd wipe for us for the usc we're like, we'll sit down and talk about it. I mean, what what do you need? So they they explained it. And I, and I said, yeah, we can make that wipe for you, but I, I need my name on there. And I, I need to be mentioned on there somewhere. And they're like, well, we have a really strict licensing agreement with the UFC. You know, we can't put your name on there. I'm like, well, I don't know if I could do it then. I, I need to be, I need to build my brand, not your brand. So when I said that, one of the guys in the meeting heard that. Well, he just to have to be the guy that handles licensing for the UFC. So he's like, hey, are you serious about building your brand? And I said, yeah, I'm not building somebody else's brand. I want to build my brand. I'll make the wipes for them, but I want to build my own brand. So they said, well, let's sit down and start discussing that. And then that's how the ball started. That's awesome. You and that's just... Yeah, stand up for yourself. I mean, well, I'll yeah. turn out a million dollar deal to build my own brand. I don't care. Well, yeah, because you're going to get it on the back end of building yeah. your brand. Like 10 times that, yeah. And that's what people don't understand is that when you give something up on the front end, the, the right away, oh, yeah, you're going to give me money, I'll have instant cash flow, you're giving up your back end and your future. That's what people don't get about business. It goes back to the uneducated Polish policeman thing. You know, you just kind of <laughs> do what you think is right. I love it. All right, is there anything else about defense soap tools, defense soap? Guy Seiko, West Shore, anything I missed? Anybody we didn't shout? Del Santer, Del Santer placed, right? Uh, Zach, yeah, the show pony. He's the show pony. <laughs> Zach placed. I didn't shout him out. So shout out to Zach Del Santer. I believe Zach's going to UPenn, right? Yeah, and what a great kid he is. You, you, uh, you kind of look at him, you, you don't know how to take him. He's a big, big redheaded kid. You know, he's kind of like, well, can be a little into What a super nice kid. I mean, super polite, super down to earth, hard working. But yeah, we call him the show pony when he was little. He he wasn't always the hardest worker in the room, but what, come match time, and that kid showed up to wrestle. So he, he, his nickname is the show pony. Okay. Perrysburg, 
finished behind St. Edward. They had, I want to say, two placers. You guys had three. The greatest state tournament in Division One last year, well, besides the year Wadsworth upset St. Ed's, Gus was on that team. I think that was 2010. What do you foresee six state finalists returning for the uh, the Perrysburg uh, Yellow Jackets? The Eagles don't have as many, you know, top-end people that Perrysburg has. How do you foresee that? And I know I can't wait to hear your way in on this, but you got to go with the Eagles on that if you're if you're a betting man, right? Yeah, there, there's guys in that lineup. For example, Timar. How many people? Timar wasn't even ranked coming into. I think he's ranked like 13th in the state. He'll be ranked number one in the state by before much longer. Um, so guys like Timar, who you don't even know, all of a sudden he's a state finalist, right? Bradley Eaton. Don't count that kid out. You know, both Miller brothers, they should be state finalists. It's gonna be it's gonna be St. Ed's. Um, it's gonna be a battle. Perrysburg's very good. They got some very talented kids, but we have more depth. We we just have the depth. And depth just gets it. Here's the wildest thing about that guy. That came down to Bennett and Tackett in the finals. It was a head to head, and it was like what Gus did to Jerome Robinson. You know, he beat him every time. Tackett's beat Bennett every time that year. And then Bennett flipped the result in the state final. Yep. And he, yep. And then Geog just put the icing on the cake. Yes. Geog was just but kind of a cherry on top. Last, last two matches of the tournament. Yeah. It's pretty tight. Pretty. And they're a good team and they're well coached. And, and it's great to have competitors, but they'll be there for a certain amount of years. And then it'll be somebody else we got to deal with. Yeah. There always seems to be ever, somebody's always nipping at your guys' heel, no matter what. Obviously, Brexville. Maslin, Perry, Wadsworth, you know, Dublin Kaufman's kind of the new one out of Central Ohio, Liberty. Someone's always presenting a challenge to the St. Edward Eagles, and it's always been fun to watch how they've able, been able to rise to the occasion so many times. Now, Graham, Graham, hey, let's talk about this. You see the new takeover in D2? Who's coming? Who's coming for Graham? One of your former guys, Colin Palmer, right? Yep. Colin Palmer and DeSales are coming for Graham. It looks Graham, like Graham, there could be up in this year. Graham had a, I always tell people I have the crystal ball to high school wrestling because I'm so involved in the youth level. Number one, West Shore has won the state championship for the last couple of years. And then all the same kids are coming back and all the same kids are going to St. As. Nothing's going to change there. But what Graham did was interesting is their entire sixth grade class last year, they held back. They held back the entire sixth grade class. They're all seventh graders. There. They have a very solid junior high team. So it can be interesting to see how we match up with that. Um, I think we're going to blow them away into little kids. But last year they beat us. Remember we took second? Yes. It's, it pissed me off. It's because that was all those holdback kids that they had. They're all gone. So either they, they better reload something because I'm coming with a really good team. Um, and then we'll deal with the one year of holdbacks that they had. Okay. Let me tell you the new name for that. Do you want to know the new name for, for holdback red shirts? Do you want to know the new name? Cheating. <laughs> reclassed. Oh, reclassed. Okay. It's called reclassing. Yeah. I've Honestly, never... are you going to reclass Max? If it comes to it, Max is a peanut going into eighth grade. Would you reclass him? No, I'm going to push him ahead a year, I think, because all of his drill partners are a year older than him. I don't know who he's going to drill with his eighth grade year. I love that you're like, nope, we're going to throw him to the wolves. Nope, we're going to go ahead. We're going to go. We're going to reclass up. But what people don't realize, what people miss, and I, I've had this conversation. I can't. I can show you the letters in my office where I say, guy, you were right. We should have listened to you. How many kids that were held back, they were murdering people their eighth grade year, and they hold them back, and they have no one to wrestle. Now you have a kid that needs to be, needs development, and he's stuck in my room, or he's stuck wrestling other eighth graders when he should be in the St. Edge room, wrestling the Walsh, you know, Iron Man, wrestling high school kids, wrestling that schedule and growing. But no, they held their kids back during a very important year of development. And now they're, they got no one to wrestle. I see it all the time. Holding, I, the only time I would hold somebody back is if you had, you, know, you weighed 60 pounds, or if you had like a, a learning deficiency. Other than that, just go. I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, my biggest thing is, like, I think my nephew Owen is, like, uh, my nephew Owen, my brother Chad, my brother Ferd are, like, the only Miller boys to not 
like we got we got held back because of reading, because of whatever the thing was. They didn't hold us back because of sports. They no, held they, us back because we were dunces. Yeah, they they do that now. The, Gus was not able to wrestle in Fargo his freshman year because he was too young. Yeah, you know, he, I, he, I'm he, with he, you, man. If we can push Tommy, if I could have pushed Thomas, my son, into kindergarten this year, I would have. But they said it was a maturity thing, and you know, you got to be able to wipe your own backside, you know, stuff like that, guy, where the yeah. teacher can't come in the bathroom and do. But that's I get that, right? Like I get when it's a maturity issue like that. I wouldn't have mind pushing him forward, but I I'm with you on the holding back thing, unless you're a dunce like all the Millers were. <laughs> It's yeah. funny. It's funny to think about it, but like we've all like, like we all got held back in like either first grade, kindergarten, whatever it was, first grade usually, because that's that's like a big reading development time. And uh, I'm with you on that. All right. Do you have anything else for me? No, but it's, I think it's way past my bedtime. It's like eleven o'clock. <laughs> Ten fifty three. Yes, guy. Thank you for the time. I will see you. Well, I what's what's going on Saturday? Saturday nights are weigh-ins. Set no Friday. Friday night is way it's for middle school or grade school state champ. I'll be in Sandusky. I won't be here for Wayans. I will be coaching um, grade school states Saturday. Grade school state duels are Saturday. I'll be wrestling that, coaching that, and then we have defense soap duels the next day. So you're doing the 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 two things that I'm doing that they're back to back that are piggybacking off each other. You're going. I'll be at both of them. You'll be at both of them. Yeah, be at both of them, and then, um, yeah, we we expect we're expecting to win. Um, grade school, we'll be very disappointed if we don't win. Um, this grade school state duels. I mean, you never know who's gonna happen. You're never gonna show up with a really tough team. Um, but I have a really tough team, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, and then the next day, you know how that is. We're just gonna try to go in there and battle as best as we can. I love it. All right. Guy Seiko, thank you for the time. Thanks for coming on the Ohio podcast. Go Ohio Cast podcast. Stick around. I'll talk to you for a little bit afterwards here, right? All right. Talk to you. Thanks, Zeb.